All right, so we talked about pressure and force, and now the uh, way we calculate hydrostatic pressure, and hydrostatic meaning hydro, meaning water, and static meaning it's not moving or flowing. And the way we do that, we have a formula that we typically follow, and the pressure, and that could be in PSI or KPA, is all about the height of the fluid. That is where the height is. So H is equal to height of the fluid. And we almost always have inches, feet, or meters. So this is all about height of fluid right here. And in this spot, we have density according to the height of the fluid. Now we're gonna talk about water right now, where if I had an inch of water, I would multiply, right there, multiply the density by 0 0.0361 PSI per inch of water. So this is my height, this is the density. So if I'm working with feet of water, I would multiply by 0. <laughs> I need to get that right. There we go. 433 PSI per foot. And if I'm working with meters of water, I would then have to multiply by 9.81 kPa per meter of water. And that was equals my pressure. So to calculate, again, any pressure, you see what increments of measure you're working in. For example, if I had a pipe that was, I don't know, it's a pretty bad pipe. So if I had a pipe 30 feet tall and I had a pressure gauge at the bottom, what does my pressure gauge read? And if it was full of water, I simply take my height and I multiply it by what is in feet here. 0 0.433 PSI per foot. And that would equal 12.99, 12.99 PSI is the pressure on that gauge. So that's really simple. You guys should know this. It's very much easy to calculate. I guess before I continue on, we should know that all of our calculations that we do are always- hey, I'm still copying that. Okay. You know what? You know all what right. a really cool thing about one of these is? Is that I can record it, but that's okay. Right or I could even email you this document once we're complete. Well, also, yeah, wants to save this Sorry. you can also uh, print screen uh, this right now and just uh, rewrite it later. You could screenshot it too. I, I never said nobody Take can a do picture. it. Be able to figure out how to copy a link. I don't think he's going to figure yeah, out. Yeah, I'm not computer savvy here. Okay. Uh, Doug, I understand. A question about you know what, well. Theo? Writing this stuff down is always better than just taking a picture. Um, because the more you write it down, the more you will actually remember it. It, it reinforces it a little better. So I, I don't mind. I don't mind. Yes, you can continue now. I'm caught up. Okay. Okay, so Again, before we do any of our calculations, we want to know that we're working at STP. Does anybody know what STP means? Standard temperature and pressure. Oh, yeah. OK, so we're going to talk about these for a second. So standard temperature. Now, when you're filling up your fuel for your vehicle at the gas station, it says it right on there, um, but it, it actually accurately should be 15.5 degrees Celsius, right at the gas pump. It's gonna say this volume is corrected to 15 degrees C. 
So that's why in Canada, we bury our gas tanks underground. So they have a constant temperature or, you know, consistent temperature anyways. The uh, imperial, met or imperial equivalent is 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is standard temperature at that point. Standard pressure happens to be in PSI A is 14.7 PSI A, or the metric equivalent is 101 kPa. Now we do have a mercury equivalent to this pressure, and that is actually 29.92 inches of mercury and the metric equivalent to that is 760 millimeters of mercury. So this is the weight of the atmosphere at sea level, right? Ooh, it's at sea level. So that is the mass of the atmosphere at sea level. And it's atmospheric pressure that works when we try to pull or suck on a straw or pull water up from a uh, well, if you will, or a cistern. So if we had a pool of water down here, right, let me just make it full of water. Oh, look at that beautifully. And if I had a pump that was tied to this and I'm trying to pull water up a pipe into a pump to put for my house, my maximum theoretical suction I can achieve in this is through atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure exerts downwards on the water, enabling me to take that water and bring it up this pipe. So we can calculate theoretically how high a perfect vacuum can lift water. So we could take atmospheric pressure and we can divide it by the pressure per foot. And then we get about 33.9 feet of suction is the maximum theoretical lift you can get from a pump. Virtually, listen, uh, actually you can only get about 25 feet of lift because you have all kinds of other issues going on. You have friction losses, you have the pipe, you have fittings, you have all kinds of things. And we here in Alberta are at a higher elevation Hence, our pressure right here, this pressure is lower in Alberta than it is say, at sea level. The atmospheric pressure here in Alberta is actually more closer to 12 PSI, if you did not know that. But that's just one thing. And now we should have a metric equivalent of this number and we could just simply go 101 kPa divided by 9.81 kPa per meter and we come out to about 10.4 meters of theoretical, maximum theoretical lift I can get from a pump. So that was a little bit of STP and some applications for that. Do I need to go through in who discovered atmospheric pressure and how they calculated those numbers? Should I say anything about that? Or do we know? Do we know the guy's name, Torricelli? Does that ring any bells to anybody? From first year, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, can I move on? Can I move my screen here? Yes. I want to talk about something like total force. So we know uh, total force is equal to the pressure times the area. And if I did that in a formula triangle, that would be force 
is equal to pressure times area, yeah. So for example, if I had a tank, I know that sometimes my drawing is really poor, so apologize for that. So pressure is calculated per square inch. Force is for the entire area. It's basically the mass of the water exerted downward and we calculate the total force on the bottom, okay? Total force is how much it weighs pushing down over the entire area is what total force is. And for example, if I had this tank and it was 20 feet tall, so, and it was full of water, and it had a diameter of uh, six feet, three inches. I want you to calculate the total force on the bottom of this tank. Now I'll walk you through it, of course, because I don't want to leave anybody hanging in a review. So I told you that Pressure times the area is equal to the force. So pressure is equal to the height of the fluid times by the density of that fluid. So my pressure is equal to 8.66 PSI. Now, the area on the bottom here, I have a diameter of six foot three inches. What is my pressure in? Can anybody tell me what increments of my pressure is in here? A little hint. Inches. Inches. Square inches. Square inches. Thank you. So look, I have two dissimilar increments to measure my diameter. So I'm going to convert my diameter into inches. So I come up with square inches. So six times 12 is 72 plus three is 75 inches. And that then makes my radius 37.5 inches. Now, area of a bottom of this tank, because it's circular, area is pi r squared. So now I have to calculate the area of the bottom of this tank using my radius. So area is equal to 3.1416 multiplied by 37.5 squared. So the area is equal pretty close to this number. And now I have my area and my pressure. I can multiply them together. So that's 8.66 PSI multiplied by 4417 inches squared. Look at the square inches get canceled off. I'm left with pounds of force, which is 3825.122 pounds or 0.22 pounds, sorry. That should be a decimal right there. Eight, three, eight, two, five, eight decimal. Close enough. Cool. Give me a second with that. Noah, is it mudding time? Say again. Where are you going, Noah? Do I still have my camera on? Is, is Noah in the room? Yeah, I'm here. So you're driving? Replay. 
No, I, you can you can unmute your camera. We want we want to talk to you. We want to make funny a little bit, you know, before we carry on. I mean, that's just what we do, isn't it? Nice seeing you, though. It's been a long time. Oh, you're muted. Do you know who's talking? <laughs> you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> there you go that's better <laughs> Noah yeah. hey <laughs> yeah hi Noah how are you today <laughs> okay Okay, we're gonna wait for Noah to get back to his to his office. All right, I'm gonna go back to this. All right, thanks, Noah. I appreciate you logging in. All right, so that's force right there, people. Excellent. All right, let's get to something else here. We gotta talk about water a little bit. Water, as you know, whoa, look at this. This is a picture. Okay, water, we need to know some certain temperatures about water. And one of them, is a temperature scale, as you know, water at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, we can change water into steam, okay? That's where the boiling point is, and that is equal to 100 degrees C. Water happens to be most dense at 4 degrees. 39 degrees Fahrenheit, yes, at four degrees C. Water is most dense. This is where water is the heaviest. It's heavy in here. Oh, I just that wrong. Water is very heavy. Can you possibly mute heavy. everybody? Say again? Can you possibly mute everybody? Because there's a lot of background noise happening. Sure, I think I can. I think I have that capability. There we go. Thank you. Anything. All right. Water is most dense at this temperature. That's why when you dive into a lake and you go down near the bottom, that's where the heaviest, densest water is and coldest. So anyways, here at this point is the freezing point. So that's zero degrees C or 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the freezing point. And that's important. And this is the boiling point. That's important. And what happens to water when it goes from four degrees C and colder? Oh, you know what? I put that on the long line. That's okay. Let me just put this here. 32 and zero. <laughs> so as water goes colder down to the freezing point, it expands slightly. That's why I made this little expansion thing here. It expands slightly. And then when it freezes, it expands 7.5% its volume. So it expands 7.5% its volume. And quite frankly, that's why pipes split. That's why pipes break apart and split. It's because of it expanding that much. That's a big rapid expansion. So also when water from four degrees going all the way to the boiling point, it expands again. And it expands about 5% its volume. And this 
is the reason why we need expansion tanks in our um, heating systems, right? Does everybody know that? I hope you know that. Does anybody, does anybody know what an expansion tank is? Yes. Yes? Yep. Okay. Have you seen one in action? Because I'm going to show you one right here. Got to grab this. Can you see on the screen my hydronic heating picture? Yes. Yep. yes sir. Okay. So right here is the expansion tank. So expansion tanks are designed to take up the expansion of the water in here and not in the system. We don't want the water expanding in the system causing undue pressures. We want the expansion to take place in these. And this is a couple of different pictures of expansion tanks. Um, and this shows a cushion tank where it's just water and air, no bladder. This is a very old school type thing where you would have an air separator and the water would bubble up into this big air cushion that has up here. But we are probably more familiar with a bladder type expansion tank. And as you can see, the pressure is 12 PSI on one side of it, 12 PSI on the other side. So as we increase the temperature, watch what happens to the expansion tank and the gauge on the expansion tank. So, so the, the temperature is increasing, the expansion takes place inside the tank and the pressure here, the air gets compressed here and not in the system, okay? So that's water expands when it's heated. And so we need some place for that expansion of that water to take place. And as the water cools down, as you can see, my bladder goes back into place here. Cool. And then you should install these with a shutoff valve, um, well, you can isolate the water makeup, of course, but you should shut off, uh, have a shutoff valve and a way to drain these off. Because if you don't have a way to drain the pressure off of this tank, if you have to unscrew that, that's going to be full of water. And as soon as you unscrew it, you're going to have all that black boiler water shoot right up your nose. And that's not pleasant, but it's so fun to watch apprentices do that. I mean, got to have fun somehow. All right. Are we back to the screen? Are you guys back to my whiteboard? Just checking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. OK, so now once you get water past the boiling point, you will have steam. And water expands. 1,700 times its volume. So that's the steam. So it expands 1,700 times its volume. Wow, what an illustration that is, eh? Is that pretty or what? We're good? Got it? So as you can see, this is what we've done so far. So uh, for Noah, who's on the highway, um, I don't know, take a picture with your phone, but. No, we're recording this, so it'll be available later for you to watch, okay? So don't worry about it. I want you to drive safe. So if hey, I, would, I would prefer you drive safe than pay attention to me, okay? I'm just listening, I'm just listening. Okay. Well, then I'm going to make jokes about you the whole way through. This is good because you have more of a soothing voice than Dennis. Oh, yeah. I got a face for radio is what you're saying, right? No. All right. So that's water characteristics. Now, uh, speaking of water, 
Uh, we should understand and know the densities of water. And there's other materials as well. But first off, what is density? Density is a mass per unit of volume. So that's the definition of density. And we have a density triangle formula that we use where the mass divided by the volume is equal to density. Now, always a mass per unit of volume. So water has a bunch of different densities that we use. Can anybody just shout out a density of water if you got one? Anybody? Anybody? 4.81? No. 62.4. That's right. 62.4. 6 7.5. Pounds 8 .3. per Q. Whoa, whoa, slow down. I'm writing this out. I'm not, I'm not a court dictator taker. I can't do shorthand. So 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, which means that if I had a box that was one cubic foot. That's one cubic foot. So if I had a box like that and I filled it up with water, that would equal 62.4 pounds of water, right? So that's where we get the 62. <laughs> Sorry, I just looked at Noah and he's like hot boxing right in front of us. I don't even know. Just kidding. <laughs> I look over I and I see your picture is. and he's just blowing out this is. plume of smoke. Pretty funny. Okay, so 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, that's where we got that. So I know if this was 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches, that's 1,728 cubic inches in one cubic foot. So we can get the density of water in cubic inches by taking um, 62.4 pounds and dividing it by, so this is per cubic foot, and dividing it by 1728 cubic inches per cubic foot, and we come out with 0 0.0361 pounds per cubic inch. See, the cubic feet get knocked off. So that's water's density so far. Now, if I had one cubic meter of water, it's going to weigh 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, but I do know that one liter is equal to one kilogram as well. I know that number right there, yes. And we want two other densities of water that we typically work with, and one of them is a US gallon. What, what is, does anybody remember? Five. How much? 7.5. No. How much does uh, the water in, use? Imperial gallons, 6.24. One US, US gallon weighs 8.33 pounds per gallon. And that is US. An imperial gallon is 10 pounds per gallon. And that is imperial. Now, the other couple of things that I heard you guys say was 7.5 gallons per cubic foot US and 6.24 gallons per cubic foot Imperial. Those were the other two I heard. These are not densities. Density has to have a mass with a volume, a mass with a volume, mass and volume, mass, volume. These don't have a mass and a volume. It is how much volume of a fluid I can get into a volumetric container. Okay, so it's a little different. And uh, 
we could calculate densities of certain objects. I mean, I could even calculate the density of Doug. We could uh, find out how dense I am, so to speak. I mean, I know you know I'm dense, but you know, we could actually find out. So what I do is I take my mass. Boy, COVID hasn't been very good to me. I've gained a few LBs here. So my mass, for example, is about 175. And I have a volume of about 2.5 cubic feet. So what is Doug's density? Does anybody know? 70. 70 pounds per cubic foot. Now, you guys can see that bringing your increments of measure through any calculation that we are doing becomes incredibly important, okay? So anything you're writing down, make sure you write down the increments of measure with this stuff, okay? It's important, especially moving forward with some of the stuff we have to cover. So, my, I'm dense, I'm 70 pounds per cubic foot. So am I denser than water? You'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. we can fall. actually figure out Doug's relative density by taking here, let me just draw another formula triangle here. If I take the density of the object. And if I divide it by the density of the standards, now the density of object is whatever it is you're working on. The density of standards are water, right? Ooh, that's a water. And we know water to be 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. We know water to be 0 0.0361 pounds per cubic inch. We know water to be 1000 kilograms per cubic meter. So that's for water and we can do the gallon too. But if we're working with gases, if my density of my object is a gas, then we compare it to air. And air has a density of 0 0.076 pounds per cubic foot or 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter. So this formula triangle is the density of the object divided by the density of a standard and that would equal my relative density or sometimes called specific gravity. So Doug's density was 70 pounds per cubic foot. I could find my relative density by dividing by the standard of pounds per cubic foot, which is this one. 1.1217. My relative density is 1.1217. And yes, if I was in a swimming pool full of water, so we'll give it that water effect here. Oh, there we go. If Doug was in a swimming pool full of water, Doug would sink. That's why I sink when I'm in water, in the swimming pool of fresh water, I sink because I am heavier than water. But we also have a buoyant force pushing up on any object immersed in a fluid. And the amount of buoyant force is directly related to volume. For example, Doug's volume is 2.5 cubic feet, which means that the buoyant force exerted upwards on me when I'm immersed in a fluid
So the buoyant force is equal to, let me just do this. 156. Is 156 pounds. So when I'm in the swimming pool, there's 156 pounds of buoyant force pushing up on me. Meaning when I am in the swimming pool, uh, what is it? 19 pounds, yeah. I only weigh 19 pounds in the swimming pool. So I'm pretty light, I'm pretty buoyant, but I'm not buoyant enough to float. So this is the only way I can sweep my girlfriend off her feet is in the swimming pool. I can't do it otherwise because <laughs> I'm not strong enough. So for example, what if Doug in this swimming pool put on a personal flotation device? Okay, there's my arm. You, you compensate for the 19 pounds and then you would be floating. Well, I'm going to tell you that that this personal flotation device is equal to a volume of one cubic foot. Well, that's 62.5.2 pounds going that's up. That's right. So I will have an extra 62.4 pounds of buoyant force pushing up on me, making it uh, the buoyant force of 211, 18.4 pounds of buoyant force now pushing up on me, and then Doug will float. Uh, there we go. Here's my little flight deck. Okay, cool. How's that for a lesson so far? Overwhelming. It is overwhelming, but good, I'm glad. So tell you what guys, take a 10 minute break. Okay, please uh, grab yourself a drink, um, stretch your legs. Noah, keep the two hands on the wheel. Oh wait, you're in your house already. Yeah, I'm back. How you doing? Long time no see, man. Yeah, remember when I said I wouldn't pass? Remember how worried I was and then I passed? Remember that? It's because of you. Oh, that's very kind. Take a break. Go get a coffee. All right. I'll be Here's back. In... A quick run to the liquor store. I'll be back in ten. Is that a hey, tutor? Day drinking doesn't start till tutor time at three o'clock. Okay. All right. We'll start that. <laughs> yeah, you buy you buy a hot water tank. It's uh, sized in gallons, right? So that's right, and it's usually U.S. gallons. Is that not right, yeah. Jeremy? Yes. Um, we buy a lot of products. They're the biggest trading partner the U.S. is. So if they say we're using Fahrenheit or we're using U uh, U.S. gallons, then we say okay, that's fine. So that's why, and they have a bigger population than us and they, yeah. So temperature conversions, here is the two formulas that you need for temperature conversions. If you don't have these written down somewhere, uh, I would suggest that you know how to do that. Now, again, there's some easy ways of figuring this out. I know that zero degrees C is equal to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And I know that 100 degrees C is equal to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So anytime you're doing a question and involves this, look at your answer to see if it would fit within that range of what that temperature should be, okay? So there's a couple of ways of doing it. I had an American vehicle and on, on the dashboard, it showed the temperature, but it was always in Fahrenheit. So we get in the car in the morning and I drive my kids to school and it would say like 58 degrees Fahrenheit. And they would say, dad, what is that in, in Celsius? And I say, well, you can figure it out. What you do is just simply minus 32 off of that. And they could do that quick enough, which is 26. And I said, then divide it by two. And that is really close enough, but usually it's divided by 1.8 to get a more easy answer. But that was just an easy, quick, dirty conversion of Fahrenheit to Celsius. So there's another story for you right there. Okay, so let's go over, oh, what am I I'm pulling stuff all over the place here. And here's some nice to know temperatures as you should know these. Now we live in Canada. So this one right here at zero degrees Fahrenheit or minus 17 degrees Celsius, salt stops working on the roads. So the products that they're dumping on the roadways stop working at that temperature. Hence, in this province, we end up putting gravel on the darn roads. So Doug has broken windshields every freaking year. I drive around this province. So that's when salt and the brine that they put on the road stops working. Then they put gravel to piss me off. So this is where water is more dense. We talked about that already. This is where the water boils and we did this. Now, this absolute zero number will be important next year. Because uh, we say Boyle's Law and Charles Law into third year gas now. So we don't cover it in second year uh, plumber math and science. I don't know why I would prefer we did, but that's not my choice. So that's next year, the absolute numbers. Is so that like the, a, impossible to get any colder than those numbers? No. And that's in a perfect vacuum, Philippe, uh, and it would be it would be in space, right? Um, I don't think they've achieved those numbers. They figure that is the absolute zero and coldest it could be. Uh, oh. It's where all molecular movement stops. At least the molecular movement that we are aware of. Now, I don't know how many shows of ancient aliens these guys are watching, but there you go. Stargate. There's things are weird out there. Good. So the difference between temperature and temperature change. And that's important for us plumbers and gas fitters to know that difference because we sometimes need uh, to know what a boiler is feeding and what's coming back. So we need to know what we typically call delta T, yeah? And delta T is the difference between two temperature points. So delta T is used in a lot of this vernacular and you should have that coming up in, in heating theory and in math, um, this delta T. So it's the temperature difference between two points on a scale. For example, if I had something at minus uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit and I went up to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, the difference between these two is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, delta T. So you can see there's a difference in temperature change there. Clear, 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 all right. 
So now we have some nice to know temperatures. So when you're going into your uh, the beauty salon and you're getting a pedicure, they take your temperature with a, oh wait, does everybody get pedicures? I do, there's a, oh man, they're fantastic. I love it when I get a pedicure. Don't knock it until you try it. Anyway, they take your temperature and they wanna make sure that you have a body temperature. Why? Because we're in COVID, yes? Maybe we should do that when you guys come into the shop, shop class, give you a little shot and see your temperature. This is room temperature for some, not my room temperature. I like my room temperature about 65 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit. My wife though likes it a little higher. So that is, is one thing that we, you know, we fight about. But what I didn't tell her is I, uh, I replaced my thermostat and uh, I put it on my phone. Oh, my background won't let me show you that because of my virtual background. So I'll just put none here. Okay, so if I convert that 65 degrees Fahrenheit to 67, you just, you just said, it gives you about 18 degrees Celsius. Yes. And now look at my house is at 21. And oh, I got it. So I have to change the temperature. So I, I click on it and then I could move the dial and I can turn it down. I could turn it up, whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. So my wife thinks she's cold. She says, turn up the thermostat. And I say, sure. She goes, I'm still cold. I said, put on a damn sweater. Like, come on. And then what you sleep of, on the couch. What kind of stat do you have that have a program to your phone? Is that one of those Nest ones or no? Yeah, it's a Nest. Yes. And what is your opinion on those? I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I turn down the heat when I go to bed and my wife doesn't even know it. She sleeps like a baby. <laughs> right? She has no clue. And she wakes up, she feels a little chilly. And then when I'm just before I get in the shower, I turn up the, the thermostat and she has another 20 minute nap and she's nice and warm. Like she doesn't know what's going on. And, and I like that <laughs> because I don't feel in power and control in my own house if I, you know, most of the time. It's good. More story. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm boring you. Let's see. Look at this. Look at this temperature, setting up a hot water tank, 140 degrees. Do we know why we need to set our hot water tank at that hot? It's for the Legionnaire's disease thing. Right? That's right. If you have standing water though, this is the important part. Standing water being heated over a long period of time, you can get some kind of bacteria forming in your water commonly known as legionnaires or other things. And this is what happens when you go on vacation for three weeks and you come home and your hot water tank's been sitting there, not flowing, not moving, just that nice, warm, tempered water. If you just want to sit it there, it's going to create some bacteria. So the first thing I recommend you ever do when you come back from a long holiday is wash your clothes first don't have a shower first. Get that hot water tank firing. Get that water moving, okay? You can even tell that to your clients um, as, as you, they're on holidays, et cetera. You just, just do that. You're never in any um, way in harm. Uh, boiler setting, typical boiler setting, and this 180 degrees is Output boiler temperature. Output. You want to boiler. share the screen there, Doug? Am I not sharing yeah. my screen again? No, we're looking at you. I was wondering the same oh. thing. <laughs> you know, some <laughs> days I shouldn't care, but I did. There you go. Look, I was circling stuff. I'm making annotations everywhere. Nobody's seeing nothing. <laughs> so normal hot water boiler setting, 180 degrees. That's output. It's how much heat you're putting into the water going out to the system. And uh, you'll learn in heating that the 20 degree return is about 160 degrees is standard for that. 
low pressure steam, maximum 250 degrees for the steam going out. Okay, so those are nice to know temperatures. All right. Wow. Okay, let's uh, let's get a couple of more pages in here. Okay, we got that, we got that, we got that. Uh, let's take that one and that one. Okay, so objective two out of this ILM starts talking about heat and how we create heat and how we measure heat and heat energy. So energy, they're saying here, is the ability to do work, and it comes in many forms, electrical, mechanical, sound, atomic, solar, okay, this heat energy, and we typically call it a BTU, right? And it's important also for us to know what a BTU is. Does everybody know what a BTU is? It's the amount of energy needed to raise one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit or one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. Uh, you're correct for the first part. It's one degree Celsius requires 4.185 kilojoules or we use 4.2 kilojoules. Okay, so here it is. I've underlined it. One BTU is the amount of heat required to change the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. Okay, so that is the definition of a BTU. And then the metric equivalent is a kilojoule. And that's how we write it. And that is one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. It takes 4.2 kilojoules to do that. It takes only one BTU to do this pound by one, okay? So very close, Philippe, thank you. I was trying to remember from last year. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's hard. So, and then we come up with something called sensible heat. Sensible heat is also important to us because we typically use sensible heat in most all of our applications for space heating, um, hot water, domestic hot water usage, et cetera. We do, Mostly always we're talking about sensible heat. And sensible heat is the heat that is change in temperature only. This is important right here. Only, only, only. Sensible heat is what we use. And we have a formula to calculate sensible heat. And that formula calculating sensible heat. So the heat, and the heat is always in BTUs or kilojoules, if it's metric. The heat is always calculated by taking the mass of the fluid we're heating or the, whatever. It could be air, it could be water, it could be glycol. It's the mass of that substance multiplied by the temperature change or delta T, multiplied then by something called a specific heat capacity. So this is the formula we are going to use to calculate sensible heat. So let's try to unpack or understand what sensible or this specific heat capacity and what that is. It's basically a multiplier. So my sensible heat is a multiplier. Okay, and we're going to have a table with these multipliers on it. So the definition for a specific heat capacity is the specific heat capacity of a substance is the quantity of heat. So it's a little bit different to change the temperature of one unit of mass by one degree, okay? And the table that they give us is gonna be on the next page. 
And I just want to go straight to the table. So here's the table. So the, I'm going to just, uh, let me move it over here. Yeah, okay, get it closer. Perfect. Okay, so the specific heat capacity of water is one BTU per pound per degree Fahrenheit. So this is our multiplier. So if we're talking about water for a specific heat capacity right here, it's going to be one. And the metric equivalent to that is 4.2. If we are doing a sensible heat equation, remember this was sensible. And if we're talking about ice, it is 0 0.5 is our multiplier. And for metric, it is two. And if we're talking about raising the temperature of steam, we're going to use a multiplier or specific heat capacity of 0 0.5, or metric is 2. And for air, propane, so you can see the list of numbers we're going to use as our multiplier for sensible heat calculations. So let me walk you through a few examples of calculating sensible heat. Let me just pull this, I'm gonna, uh, let me just grab that over here. I'm gonna grab this. Okay, and I'll just bring it down here. Or I can just, oop, I don't want that. I want this one, there we go. Oh, nothing came with it, okay. I'll just start up here, I'll start fresh. <laughs> Trying to manipulate this program sometimes is a little hard. So let me just go back here. Let me do a couple of sensible heat calculations. First off, I want the formula handy, okay? So the heat, which is in BTUs or kilojoules is equal to the mass times the delta T times the specific heat capacity. There is my sensible heat formula. And now let's do a question. So, ooh, get back over there. So say if I had 25 US gallons and I wanted to raise the temperature of this gallons of water, raise the temperature from 48 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. How much heat does it take? So anytime we do one of these questions, see this little thing here called the mass? The mass right here, the mass always has to be either in pounds or kilograms. That's how we measure mass. So we have to convert anything that we see into pounds or kilograms. And if we're working with degrees Fahrenheit, I got to make it pounds. So having said that, I have 25 US gallons. We can convert that by multiplying 8.33 pounds in one gallon, and we get a mass from that of, what does that say, 208.25 pounds. So you see the gallons get canceled out, and I'm left with 208.25 pounds. Okay, so we have a mass. Now we need a delta T. My delta T is 48 to 140. So my delta T is 92 degrees Fahrenheit is my delta T. This is my mass. And I have a specific heat capacity. I'm dealing with water. So my specific heat capacity is one BTU per pound per degree Fahrenheit. So I simply 
multiply these numbers out. Is your 19,159. Settle down there, Speed Racer. Yeah, I was waiting to. That's great. Um, one BTU per pound per degree Fahrenheit. As you can see, I can cross off my pounds. I could cross off my degrees Fahrenheit and I'm left with BTUs. And that comes out to 19,000. Philippe, what did you say? 159. Pretty good. Let's do another one, okay? I'll give you a second to catch up. Write that down. So you, again, you could see how important increments of measure are to us as we move forward doing all this math, okay? It's really important. Can I move on? Yeah. yeah, okay. So let's do another question. Um, the water coming in Calgary is pretty cold coming out right out of the tap. Does anybody know why it's so darn cold coming out of the tap in Calgary? No. It's glacial. It's glacial water. It's from the glaciers. So the glaciers are cold, frozen stuff, and we get our water from there. And that's why it's so cold coming out of our taps. So it's about 48 degrees and we're going to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So I asked for how much time because you just installed a hot water tank at grandma's house. And that 40 US gallon hot water tank has a really, you know, 25,000 BTUs per hour input. So this is how much heat is available to put in the water. So I need to know how much heat it takes to get there. Because you know what? Grandma wants a bath. And she's asking you, how long is it going to take until I'm a, allowed to have a bath with this new hot water tank you installed? So we're going to use our formula triangle for sensible heat, where it says the heat is equal to the mass times the delta T times the specific heat capacity. So we have a mass now, we have 40 US gallons. So 40 times 8.33. So this is US gallons and this is pounds per gallon. And that's 333.2 pounds of water. My Delta T, again is 92 degrees F. My specific heat capacity is one BTU per pound per degree Fahrenheit. Now I'm gonna multiply these together. I didn't put the increments of measure there, I'm sorry. Let me do that again. And if you have the answer. 30,654.4. 30, 
Okay, look at that. So that is still, that's how much heat it takes to get that up to 140 degrees. Now, I have a hot water tank, it's 25,000 BTUs per hour. And I need 30,654.4. And that gives me 1.22 hours. So you're going to say, Grandma, it takes about an hour and a half after I turn on the gas and get this burning, you could have a bath in one and a half hours. Cool? I mean, hot? I don't know. Hot for two hours. <laughs> I'm going to give you a minute to, to just finish scribing that down. Hey, Rod, Veneta, I have no idea what you're watching in the background, but, you know, it looks pretty interesting. Oh, my son is watching uh, Tom and Jerry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and my laptop is, Ooh, I, I got an old laptop. I can change my background. Oh, there you go. You got Theo's computer. Hey, and let's guess. talk to about the computers here. <laughs> you know... Here we are, 1.35 in, like, is this a two hour class or is this a four hour class? This is till three. So till three o'clock? Yeah. Two fifty. Uh, sure. Could be till two. It, yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna argue with you there. It can be till two. Well, how about we keep going and we go to around 2.30? Not, I got a lot of shoveling I gotta do, so that's awesome. Make it 2.20. <laughs> Two twenty. Whoa! May as well go whoa. to two o'clock at that point. I mean, come on. This is, this is not it's up for negotiation. Two fifty. You know what, Doug? <laughs> Why not? Yeah, the class time is till two fifty, though. Yeah, that's true. It's all this talk. I'm trying time, to change please. my mind. Let's make it two two ten. There's not much sense of rounding up. May as well just go to two o'clock. No, oh, geez. <laughs> you know what? Uh, let's just call her here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um, that would do a disservice to Dennis. Oh, Dennis, so, to open an assignment. Well, this is this is the great thing about it. So he has to open the assignment for you. Yeah. What if I posted the assignment right here in the chat? You think I can get that? Yeah, you can. What's your um, YouTube channel, Doug? Um, Doug Reed, R-E-I-D. I'll subscribe. Thanks for that, Cody. Um, so now we're on latent heat, and we missed a whole bunch because I forgot to press the button. So there you go. That's the way it is. So. Having said that, let's do a couple more examples before we take a little break, okay? So let's do a couple more examples. I'm going to ask you how much heat how much heat does it take to get Oh, no. So how much heat does it take to get 350 kilograms of water to steam? And remember, anytime I'm changing the state, I'm not changing the temperature. 
So here we go. Latent heat value says the heat is equal to the mass times the latent heat value. So the heat is equal to the mass, 350 kilograms. Multiply it by the latent heat value, which is 2,257 kilojoules per kilogram. And that equals a big number, seven, eight, nine, nine, five, zero kilojoules. Not too bad, huh? Excellent. Is that simple? You just multiply it? You got it. Your mass. So you always have to have a mass, and your mass always has to be in pounds or kilograms. If you're in metric, kilograms. If you're imperial, pounds. That's it. Cool, huh? Now, they kind of want us to put it all together. And this example here shows us a total heat calc. Okay, it's a total heat calculation here. So total heat is the sensible heat plus all the latent heats. So you have to add up all of your heats that you calculate for any specific substance. So in this example that they show here, I'll just walk you through this example. So they say that 325 liters of water from eight degrees into steam at 115. So clearly at eight degrees, we're above zero. So there's zero, so there's about eight degrees. So we have to raise the temperature of the water first to 100 and then change the state and then go up a little bit to 115. So they do it here, but I'm not a, a particular fan of doing that, but I'll show you how I do that over here using the same example. So I do write a straight line on my page, straight as I can get, to indicate my thermometer, okay? That's all I do. And then I put my temperatures on here. So I have eight degrees C, I know that there is a hundred degrees C. I always have to stop at the boiling point and then I'm going up to 115 degrees C. And it said I had 325 liters of water, which I know is equal to 325 kilograms. And now from here, I'm gonna call this equation number one, we're going to get this water from eight all the way up to the melting point. So I got to find my delta T in here, which is equal to 92 degrees C. Did you mean the, the boiling point? The boiling point. Sorry. Yeah, right there. Correct. Sorry, Philip. So that is a sensible heat equation where it is the heat is equal to the mass delta T specific heat capacity. So this is number one where my mass is 325 kilograms. Multiply that by my delta T, which is 92 degrees C. I don't know why I put F there. And times that by the specific heat capacity of water in metric, 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram per degree C. And that equals, somebody have that for me? Anybody? One, two, five, five, eight, zero kilojoules. Everybody concur with that? So you're good? Yeah? Yep. Okay, so now 
this brings me to this point. This much heat added to that water brings it up to the boiling point. And at this point here, I'm gonna call this number two, I have to change the state. Okay, I have to change the state of this water. So changing the state is a latent heat equation and they told me the heat is equal to the mass times the latent heat value. So I take my mass and I multiply it by the latent heat value of vaporization condensation, which is 2257 kilojoules per kilogram. 733525. 733525. Five. And that's how much heat it takes to change the state. And now we want to raise the temperature of this steam another 15 degrees, delta T. So that's a sensible heat equation where I'm going to call this number three. And sensible heat would say, take your mass, multiply it by the delta T, which is 15 degrees C, multiply that by the specific heat capacity of ice in metric is two kilojoules per kilogram per degree Celsius. And that equals, somebody shout it out. 9,750. And that's how many kilojoules it takes to get it from 100 to 115. And for my total heat calculation, I add all of these three together. 868, 855. Kilojoules. Pretty awesome. What's the total heat? Total heat is all of those three added together. And that's how much heat it takes to take that 325 <laughs> kilograms of water at eight degrees Celsius all the way up to 115 degrees Celsius. Okay, we're going to continue on and do some of these heat calculations. So let me write down a question here. For example, you have three pounds of ice at, I don't know, let's go negative 38 degrees Fahrenheit. We want to raise the temperature to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. How much heat does it take? So anytime I have a question like this, I draw a line on my paper to indicate my temperatures. So I will write them in on this. Now I have a starting point of minus 38 degrees Fahrenheit. I have to stop at the melting point, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, because something happens here. I have to add latent heat to that. And then I'm going to go stop at the boiling point here, because I would have to add latent heat to that. And then we're going to go all the way to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So the first step is I want to raise the temperature of this ice to the melting point. So this is equation number one. 
So I have to find my delta T between these two points. So that's minus 38 and 32. So I have a delta T of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a sensible heat equation where it says, take your mass, multiply it by your delta T. That should be three pounds. I don't know what's going on there. Your mass, three pounds, times by your delta T, which is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, multiplied by the specific heat capacity of ice, which is 0 0.5 BTUs per pound per degree Fahrenheit. So if I do that math, what I, I come up with 105 BTUs. And now that brings me up to number two. This, I have water, or excuse me, I have ice at 32. I want to change the state of that water. That's a latent heat value that goes here. So latent heat value says, take your mass, multiplied by the latent heat of fusion solidification. And that would equal 432 BTUs. Now I have this three pounds of water at 32, and I'm gonna raise the temperature of that all the way to the boiling point. So I need a delta T from 312 or from 32 to 212, which is 180 degrees Fahrenheit, delta T degrees Fahrenheit, there you go. And I would call this number three, where I'm gonna raise the temperature. Raising temperature is just a sensible heat equation where we take our mass, multiply that by the delta T, which is 180 degrees F, multiplied by the specific heat capacity of water, which is one BTU per pound per degree Fahrenheit. And that should be about two, no, that's wrong. 540. 540 is correct. Thank you. Now we have this water at 212, and I want to change the state. So I have to add latent heat. I'm going to call that step four to change that three pounds of water at 212 to steam at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Latent heat value of vaporization condensation says, take your mass, multiply by your latent heat value. And that takes 29, 2,910 BTUs to change that three pounds of water to steam. And now I'm going to raise the temperature of that steam to 350. So I'm going to need a delta T between these two, which is 138 degrees Fahrenheit is my delta T. To get it up to 350, that's sensible heat. So sensible heat says, I'm going to call this number five, step five with three pounds multiplied by my delta T multiplied by the specific heat capacity of steam, which is 0 0.5 BTUs per pound per degree Fahrenheit. 195. And that's 195 BTUs. Now to calculate the total heat, we need to take all of these heats that we calculated and add them together to get a total heat of, somebody do it for me. Excuse me, that's number five, I guess it's 207. 
Yeah. Oh, so I got a wrong number up here. Okay. Yeah, 195 is actually 207. Okay, good. Thank you for catching that. Appreciate it. So what is my total heat when you calculate all those together? 4,194. 4,194? Yeah. There's my total heat. All right, that's fantastic. Good work, guys. Let's do another one or something similar to it. Um, let's go 10. So what 10 kilograms of water was heated with 3000 kilojoules. What is the temperature change? So this is a temperature change. So this is clearly a sensible heat equation where the heat is equal to the mass times delta T times specific heat capacity. Now the beautiful thing about these formula triangles is whatever you want out of this, you simply take it out of this equation and make it equal to it. And now you just have to do that equation right there to get your delta T. So let's put that into the formula where we have the heat, which was 3000 kilojoules. And if we divide that by the mass times this, so the mass was 10 kilograms, and we times it by 4.2 kilojoules per kilograms per degree Celsius. So as you can see, the kilojoules and the kilograms get knocked off. And can somebody give me my delta T? Twelve sixty. Seven one point four. There's my answer. Pretty good, eh? So that's how you manipulate these formula triangles. Whatever one you want, take it out, make your triangle equal to it, and there it is. Simple, simple, simple. <clears throat> so now, ladies and gentlemen, um, in D2L, assignment number four, Temperature and heat calculations, assignment number four, has been released to you. All right. So it is now available on your D2L shell, in your math shell, assignment number four, temperature and heat calculations. You are now required to do that. Uh, you have this next 30 minutes of this class to start it using all of the information that you have gained. All right. So having said that, you guys have a nice day. It was nice seeing everybody again, and I'm sure we're gonna see each other again at some point.